All right, welcome everybody. Good to see you. We are going to continue uh, in actually Matthew 21 a little bit. We'll finish up there and then go over to John 4 tonight and uh, continue in our discussion of trying to look at scenes of Jesus' life and focus in on his behaviors and his actions, his decision making, the choices he made, and, and learn from those, try to see the things that we can do, maybe apply those in, in modern day scenarios. And so we, I feel like the last two are extremely interesting ones that we're going chronologically for the most part here. And, the, and these two scenes that we just studied where Jesus turns water into wine at a wedding uh, and then uh, where he goes into the temple and uh, swings around a whip and uh, breaks down and turns over the tables of what are referred to as money changers, is uh, they are, I think, interesting insights into Jesus, certainly, and ones that we cannot ignore when we try to look to apply his, his lifestyle and his decisions in our lives. So we'll continue there, and then we'll look at John 4, where he travels and, and interacts with the Samaritan woman. So we'll see that in John 4. All right, let's bow and pray, and then we'll begin. Our Father in heaven, we're humble before you, and we recognize you as the creator of the universe, the one true and living God, and we thank you that you love us so much that you have given us your only son so that we can be with you eternally. We ask that you would help us to be like Christ in everything we do, that we would recognize the great sacrifice, that we would live lives of obedience and service, and that we would encourage each other we're thankful for this time that we have to be together, that we can study your word, that you've given us your word, that you've given us the ability to understand it. We ask that you would help us to be motivated to be like Jesus in, in everything we do, that we would make good decisions, and that we would humble ourselves and serve others. We pray all these things in Jesus' name, and amen. So last time we looked at the scene where, well, the scene or scenes uh, where Jesus went in to the temple, and we, we do have two recorded events, either the same event or two different events, where he went in and saw things going on in the temple that offended him, and he took action on those to stop them. And so the, in John 2, we read um, that he, uh, it says the Passover, the Jews was near, and he went in uh, to the temple, and what did he see there? What did he see there that made him react? Okay, so money changers meaning what? Well, that's the word we only use when we study this passage. What's a money changer? What's that? Yeah, yeah, people, people doing commerce, yes? Yeah, exchanging currency in particular, trying to exchange to a, a, a temple coin uh, or just ex exchanging different types of currencies and then lots of commerce going on. Yes, please. Merchants. Yeah, these are people that are buying and selling and that are, that are, and the indication we get is that this wasn't just something that was a service to those. You know, we, like we said, this place went from 25,000 people to 100, 150, some people say 200,000 people in a 200-acre uh, area uh, during this time. And so there was, you know, there were services that were needed. There were things that, would, that were done to help people. Certainly, if people were coming to, to perform sacrifices or pay their taxes, um, we get the impression that this was not innocent things going on that were just a, a service to needy people. Jesus clearly saw this as something that was price gouging, taking advantage, uh, profiting from God and profiting from the temple. And so his reaction was to stop it was to, and we made the mention last time, just a you know, slight indicator that he didn't just come in with pistols blazing and just start knocking things over. It says he came in and saw this and made a whip before he took part in this. So he was, he was thoughtful. Yes, please. Their place, but they might, the place might not be in the church. 
Um, in the, on the outer, the, um, really the gateway into the temple, in the outer temple courts, they were, they were doing this at, an, at the most opportunistic place. The, the idea of exchanging currency, not, a, not an evil thing. The idea of obtaining something to sacrifice is not an evil thing, but clearly what this, this was being done in a way that was taking advantage. Um, and, that I, and from what we can tell, it was done in a way that was designed to take advantage. I, I, um, I always take pot shots at the movie theater but, you know, or going to a sporting event, and what they do is they sell things at, at, at much higher prices than normal, you know, uh, but then they make a rule. What's the rule at the movie theater um, if you want food? What's that? Yeah, you're not allowed to bring in your own food. You must buy ours. Well, that's you know, that's opportunistic. That is saying we're creating, basically creating an economy by which you have to buy from us if you want something. You know, at a sporting event, you know, hot dogs cost $7.50, when in reality, a hot dog should cost $1. And so that's because of, and I get the impression that uh, what was going on here was, uh, certainly I'm not saying that sporting events and movie theaters are evil, but you get the idea. The, but here in the temple, there were things going on that were taking advantage of people who couldn't afford it or, taking adv- or profiting. And so Jesus' reaction to that was to say, um, I'll, I'll read from Matthew 21 um, and verse 13. And he said to them, it is written, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. So he points out here, what is the purpose of the temple? What is it supposed to be? Yeah, a place to pray, a place to honor God, to, um, to perform required rituals and, as, a, as a part of your religion. He says it is designed to be a place for prayer for all nations, but instead they've made it into what? Yeah, a, yeah basically a, an unscrupulous business. They have turned it into a, to a a business that is profiting from others. So Jesus' reaction to that was that he fashioned a a whip of cords, it says, and he started swinging it. And he swung it to scare the people out, to scare the animals out, to basically just get, you root the people out, and to and he knocked the tables over, turned over the coins, basically just shooed everyone out. Now, what are the natural reactions? Now, obviously, there, are, you know, when you hear this for the first time, it does seem out of character, doesn't it? Uh, there aren't a lot of stories that we see about Jesus where he was fiery like this or even did something perhaps intimidating. So what's our reaction when we see this story? What's the first question we might ask about Jesus' behavior here? How was he feeling? Yeah, he seems to be demonstrating anger, uh, frustration, yeah. Yes. So that's an important distinction to make here, that he is having a, a, a reaction, you know, an energetic, frustrated, and he is taking, I mean, what we would consider to be angry or, um, you know, serious response to this. Yes, please. Yeah, this word that she used, this term we have of righteous indignation. And what we pointed out here is that what is his indignation based on? Yeah, it's, well, first of all, based on what God said this was supposed to be and now what you are making it. But it is a defense of God. It is in defense of others. And I think it's not just defending that you're, you are misusing God's temple. There is, seems to be here, particularly with the Gentiles trying to gain access, there seems to be a defense of the underprivileged as well, where he's saying, you are, making, you are taking advantage of people, and almost in this outer court, you're just blocking the way for, it, for people who want to come in and use this for its intended purpose. They're, they are taking advantage. And I'll just say that, you know, we, we, and we all think about the passage in Ephesians 4. I think a lot of us are, you know, can quote Ephesians 4 where it talks about anger. It says, be angry, 
but sin not. You know, do not let the sun go down on your anger. There's this idea about how we, you know, th there are emotional reactions we have to things where we're upset. But it says you have to be able to control that. You have to be able to end it. That is the key, is you have to be able to stop being angry. Um, and, don't, and it says don't give the devil an opportunity. Um, would, you, would you agree that when your emotions get high and when you get angry about something, can you feel the opportunity for the devil? I don't know about you, but, you know, I think I'm hoping that I'm not the only one in this room that just sometimes gets in a funk or gets in a bad mood. Often it's right after work. I will just say it's sometimes, it usually correlates to, the, you know, to being at work. And so I'll come home, and you can just feel it, can't you, that you just feel this stewing, easily frustrated, um, walking on eggshells kind of thing, that is something that happens to people. Or a person might see something that makes them very upset about how someone's being treated or another person. That is clearly something that's going to happen, and it says, but take that and harness it and use it for good. Do, it, do what's right with it. Like we see in Ephesians 4, make sure that you're able to wind it down and you're able to end it, and don't let the devil in. Don't let the devil take that opportunity. And I'll tell you, I feel that way sometimes where I have to just, you sometimes just have to keep your mouth shut, or you sometimes just have to take a breath, or sometimes just be by yourself. Jesus here <clears throat> was responded to something that he saw, <clears throat> excuse me, and he reacted to it. And I'll just ask you this question. Why did this require such a, um, an open, obvious, um, serious response? Why did Jesus come in this? I mean, you, you have to imagine he saw lots of things that frustrated him. Why in this at this time did he choose to do this? Any thoughts? Yes, please. First of all, yeah, now he was on a mission, and now you can, he can see that they're just ruining it. They're, they're ruining the whole point. And like we said, it was a house of prayer, but they made it into a house of business. I think we all know things where you maybe go through something and you realize the whole point has been lost. Or, I, you know, it's like the entire purpose of this temple now has been lost. It's now just a business place. Well, it was ruining what he was trying to accomplish. Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah, well, and so as I said, possibly he had to do it twice, the same thing. And so they're just not listening. They're not seeing. They're not understanding. And, and I think there may have been another part of this where he wanted people to see this. He wanted people to see that he was not going to let this happen. He was not going to allow this to be done and for his father's house, the temple, to be misused in this way. He was just not going to allow it. Yes. That is, a, and I will say, we live in a society where um, it's hard to rebuke a person. I would say the nature of our relationships and, and the nature of a lot of times the, the way that um, people are expected to behave toward each other, it's really hard for us to rebuke a person, isn't it? Um, it's, it's difficult to go to a person that you believe is doing wrong and tell them that. Um, it's difficult to give a person bad news. It's difficult, you know, we, that awkwardness, I will say that's, uh, that is maybe one of the greatest deterrents to any person is that, that feeling of conflict and awkwardness. And so the idea of us rebuking a person is a difficult thing to do, but it is very clearly an expectation of God's people that when they see a person who is doing wrong, they tell them that they believe it is wrong in order to rehabilitate. You know, and that there's this cycle that we have where a person does wrong, uh, they are rebuked, they are expected to confess, and then they are expected to be re renewed. That's the cycle that God has created. And so the purpose here was to, you know, remember, remember what it's called, you know, in your Bible heading, what is this called? Uh, this, is, this section is called what? The cleansing of the temple. Uh, why was it called cleansing? 
I mean, because we, we in our minds think he just can't, he rooted out all the, the, the dirty people. But why use cleansing in this scenario? Okay, it's the defilement of the temple. And the concept of cleansing is a very common concept in Judaism. In the law of Moses, it is, you know, one of the more common concepts is the cleansing rituals. So it's almost like he is going in and he is cleaning out the defilement of the temple. But in this case, we see, and maybe this is one of the lessons we take from this, is he was going to stand up against the mistreatment of God's plan and his place and his law. He was not going to let it happen. Yes, Neil? <laughs> well, yeah, was, we, in fact, we haven't even mentioned that yet, that that money flowed up. And so that, this is not just these, the, the commerce that was taking place, certainly the merchants, but this was, um, this was people that were, take, that were responsible for God's temple, for, re- responsible for this, that were benefiting from it. Um, money corrupts. God's plan. That's just the, that's the reality of it. We've seen it 10,000 times uh, in, throughout history that when a lot of money comes into play, religion is corrupt. And so we just see an example here of how that money just flowed up and was, and was benefiting all the wrong people. So Jesus was not going to stand for that. For, and so you, I think, mentioned the idea that he's also not going to stand for injustice. He is not going to stand for people being taken advantage of, for people being um, obscured from, from worship, from uh, people maybe being misguided about God's plan. He was having none of it. He was not going to stand for injustice, and he was going to make sure and speak up when he saw something that was wrong. He was not going to stay quiet when he saw something wrong. Yes. And I hesitate to think about what was in his head necessarily, but I'll say that it was clear that he wanted people to know that he took this very seriously, that he was not a pacifist, that he, was, he wanted them to know that I, um, this is not something that you play around with, and he took that very seriously. So, yes. It, standing up against that is, so it's not, this isn't even the difficulty we just talked about, about this awkwardness of having to rebuke a person or a, a one-on-one. This is going against a powerful structure, and he is having to speak up against something where, you know, like you said, you know, who's, whose place is this? Is it the Pharisees' building, uh, or is it God's? Um, I may have mentioned to you once or twice that I watch a lot of cult documentaries, and uh, you may remember that. Uh, almost all of them, about halfway through, they're interviewing people, and the people are saying, oh man, it got weird. And I, was, I realized, this is, this is bad. And I mean, they're interviewing people, they're very, these, they're very credible people. And they're saying, yeah, that guy was crazy. He was doing crazy stuff, he was doing wrong stuff, and they were stuck. And they could not they weren't, weren't able to speak up against it because of the power. They knew they would be ostracized or some killed or their lives would be ruined. And so this idea of speaking up against the establishment, speaking up against this powerful structure, um, not that I mean, Jesus wasn't afraid of it, but I think he was pointing out almost, uh, he wants everyone to know how wrong this is and how far it is from what his plan was. He knew what was right and he wanted to empower people to know what is right and to stand up for that. So anyway, I you're oh good, Don.
Yeah, and, and you didn't say this exactly, but it, it, it makes me realize that he needed to demonstrate leadership here, that he was trying to expand this, this, uh, this uh, leadership role he was playing to let people know that uh, we can get behind this guy. We trust him, and he, you know, he knows how to handle this. Yes? Stand, stand for what's right. That, 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 that's the attitude we have about what's right. And, uh, and the defense here is against the misuse, the clear misuse of God's place in this case, the, the mistreatment of, of people that God loves, and the mistreatment of the, the plan that these people were standing in the way of God's plan. So you're right. He's setting a precedent here about uh, vigilance for right. That's probably a good transition point into John 4. So if you wouldn't mind turning there, I, I think it's good for us now to kind of look at this, um, this scene in Jesus' life where it seems fairly innocuous, but an extremely valuable teaching moment happens here. Almost just one of the most important teaching moments that we see here happens here with this Samaritan woman in John 4. So let's look there. And also, I think, I also, it, we might not have time to get through all of it tonight, but there's a lot of neat practical things in this story. I just think that, that it, uh, John does this a lot. I just love seeing when it tells stories about Jesus, some of the details. Like, there's things in here that maybe don't make a huge difference to us, but I just love that we get to hear how this came to be. So it starts in John uh, 4, where it says, uh, so then when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that he was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, rather his disciples were, he left Judea and went away again to Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So let's stop just there in this kind of the setup that I think it's just interesting that this tells us that there were multiple teams of people baptizing, that we see that um, if you go back into John 3 just a little further, we won't take time to go back, we see that uh, it says Jesus was baptizing, his disciples were baptizing at the same time that John was baptizing. And so this was, this was a mission that was going on even before Jesus uh, established his church, there was baptism going on. And what does it say in, when we read from John the Baptist was the purpose of this, this baptism? Yeah, repentance for the remission of sins. And so we know that and we suspect that they were out teaching the same. Be baptized, repent for the remission of your sins. And so it says that the Pharisees had gotten wind of the fact that Jesus' disciples were baptizing even more people than John. I, you know, they were already on edge about John, but they, were, they recognized that Jesus and his disciples were doing this. So it says he left Judea, and he was going from Judea to Galilee. And it says he made the decision to pass through Samaria. Why go through, why would you go through Samaria between, this is the simplest question of the day, between Judah and Galilee, why go through Samaria? That's the, the, that's the direct route. Um, it's about 70 miles between Judea and Galilee, depending on where you're coming from. If you, have, if you go around Samaria, it's about 90 miles. Now, that may not mean a lot to you if you're driving, but if you are walking, that 20 miles means a lot. So it's a difference between going to Orlando through I-4, not that I-4 is great, by the way, I'm not saying anything nice about I-4, versus going 92 or cutting around to State Road 17 and whatever those things are. Um, so it's a matter of you're making the direct route. Why wouldn't he go through Samaria? Why would he not go through Samaria? What, why, you know, he's going through Samaria, but it makes the point that he did. Why would a person not go through Samaria? This is, this is not a place that Jews wanted to go through. This was, in, and the more I read about it, the, the, the more um, intense it, it seems that this relate, and we don't have to go into all the details of it, but the Samaritans can, you know, I forgive the word, but that they, they're referred to as half-breeds, where they are, they're not pure Jews, they might consider them. They, they came from this intermarrying after the Babylonian conquest, and, and this, they were also performing a hybrid religion that was not pure law of Moses. And so this, they, there was, 
a great dislike. In fact, there was this idea almost that the Samaritans were accursed. They were, they were cursed people that you wanted to have no interaction with. That is how, that is how intense this dislike was. And I, and I would say it's even more than I'm saying now that, that this idea of interacting or even going through their capital town. It says that um, he went, came to the city of Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of land that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. This is the capital city of, of the Samaritans, and he went right through it. One might say it was out of, you know, convenience, but when you read this scene that you have here, clearly he had a, a purpose that this was, a, this was an important opportunity for him. So it even gives us the detail here that this a land that was taken from the Amorites and then given to Joseph was there, and Jacob's well was there. Um, Jacob, of course, extremely important to the Samaritans. And they went through there. And this is another example we've talked already about how Jesus did not uh, avoid what were considered unsavory people. He did not avoid the the downtrodden and the disenfranchised, he went right to them. And so he went right through Samaria, and clearly with his disciples, it says, because in a minute it says they went off to get food. So I also like the fact that it says here um, in verse 6, Jesus was tired from his journey, and he was, and, and was just sitting by the well. It was about the sixth hour. I, so that little piece there I just uh, helps us humanize Jesus even more that he was going on this journey. And even this word I read, even it says that he was just sitting by the well, uh, has a little bit of an a, of intent to it that says it's almost like he was just <clears throat> flopped down. Like he was just so tired, he had to just flop down and sit next to the well. He was so tired. A human being that was having to put forth a great deal of effort. And it says this was about noon. And so he had been, been traveling all day. So this is, the, this is the scenario we see where Jesus has made the choice to travel through Samaria, go through the capital city. He's tired, and he sits down next to the well. And so then in verse 7, we see that, that this um, gets even more interesting. It says, a woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away to buy food. So uh, just this sentence would have been a shocking thing to uh, to the Jews, that he was, so there's kind of layers to this. First of all, he's in, he's in the capital city where in Samaritan territory. Then he talks to a woman, and, and certainly even a, a rabbi, a person, you know, a teacher or a rabbi would not have generally interacted or talked with a woman. So just the fact that he, he interacted with a woman here, and that it was a Samaritan woman, layers of Jesus clearly having a comfort level with this, not having this hatred uh, or this, um, this resistance for interacting with Samaritans, he was willing to interact very easily. And it says, so the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, that you, though you were a Jew, are asking me for a drink, though I'm a Samaritan woman? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. What does it seem like her reaction was? to this. Shocked by it. She seems surprised. She, and her first response is, he, all he says is, give me a drink. And her reaction is, uh, how is it that you, a Jew, are talking to me, a Samaritan woman? And then we get the little, the context here that that's just, that's a fact that they did not associate. Jesus replied to her, if you knew the gift of God and who was saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you, given you living water. What is Jesus doing here with this? I mean, she asks him a question. How, you know, how is it that you, a Jew, are talking to me, a Samaritan woman? Jesus' response is not an explanation. Well, I just was passing through. I happen to be here. I'm very thirsty. Um, I don't have my you know, thing to get water with. I don't know what that's called. But um, he could have explained that, but what is his, what does he say to her? Clearly, he, he at this point has a plan to take advantage of this opportunity and, and make it a, a teaching moment. That 
I mean, I will say this. He even grasped on very small things here. It's like all there was was giving a drink. And he is now he's setting this up. He's, I mean, I, for lack of a better term, he's trying to set this up to create curiosity and reel her in. It's like, you know what? If you knew uh, who this was, you know, it's like if you knew the gift of God and who was saying this to you, you would have asked for living water. I mean, there's a whole lot to unpack there just from that one sentence he said to her. First of all, he says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that was saying it to you, and if you knew that, you would have asked for living water. There's a lot of follow-up questions. Uh, I, you know, I immediately in that situation would say, okay, Tell me more about the gift of God. Who are you? What is living water? And so he clearly dives in here to help. Um, he's creating this curiosity. Um, he knows her. He knows what's going on. And he, is, he wants to have this conversation. So she said to him, Sir, you have no bucket and the well is deep. Where then do you get this living water? So now she is focused in on what part of what he said. Yeah, so she said, well, you know, how do we get the living water? Now, at this point in the conversation, I suspect the idea of living water was still a pretty generic concept, that, that the idea of living water uh, might have been that it was, um, uh, you know, a, a certain type of effervescent water, that it was a type of water they might have known that wasn't just like the still water, but like mineral water, like this effervescent type water. So she might have thought, well, that sounds like really good water. Tell me more about that. And she, I wish I knew, by the way, every, this whole conversation, it's hard to tell if she is asking sincere questions or if she's playing, you know, playing the game here a little bit, whether she, you know, but this question seems like another, that none of these things seem to match. And so she says, well, you don't have a bucket. Um, there's no way you can get this water. So where do you get it? Clearly, she has curiosity about this. And then um, she goes on. You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? I believe this is a, probably a continuation of him saying, if you knew the gift of God to her. I think there was some, tint, some timbre to that where he was saying, if you knew the gift of God, already somewhat questioning uh, her and her religious beliefs, almost saying, you, you, know, you don't know what you're talking about a little bit in a, maybe not, a, not an offensive way. And she responds with, you are not greater than our father Jacob, are you? He gave us this well. This is Jacob's land, and this is his well. He gave this to us, and he himself used it. So the hero of her faith the, the great leader of the Samaritans, that the, uh, Jacob, she says, this is his well. Are you saying you are greater than him? Because you're talking about us knowing the gift of God. You're talking about you being special and offering better water than is in this well. You're saying there's better water than is in Jacob's well. Now, I will say I, there is some sympathy to be had for anyone who Jesus comes to teaching in this way. I, am, I suspect I'm not the only one who has, ev who has only known the Church of Christ since I can remember. Um, in fact, I'll ask that question. How many people have never been part of another church outside of the Church of Christ? Yeah, it's the majority of the room. There is this there, there's a world that we live in, and I'm not suggesting that there's a problem with that world, but it is a world that we live in. Um, I somewhat proudly say that I am not like a fifth or sixth generation Christian. I'm a second. My parents, um, uh, my uh, mother and dad were both baptized after they were married. And uh, there is something about, though, being at least a second generation Christian where this is everything I know. Um, Sunday and Wednesday, um, up until COVID, uh, Sunday, twice on Sunday, a cappella singing, uh, a preacher's sermon, partaking of the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. Um, lots, we can name 
50 things that kind of are just part of our mentality about what this is, and it's all I've ever known. Now, as, we, as you mature and grow, you start to validate those things, and you find them for yourself, and that's all very good. And Now, I have children now who are all doing that themselves. That is very important. But there's just something to be said about the fact that this is all she knew, that she knew Jacob, and she knew this religion. And when someone starts suggesting something different, it requires a beat. It requires, it's like, it's almost like you just have to say, okay, my reality is changing here, and there has to be an innocence about pursuing that. Yes? I think also that there's a little bit of a power struggle here because this is a very unusual situation as a woman. That states that but she comes to the well and this Jew asks her for a drink. And, she, and I think she's kind of playing with this a little bit. I mean, isn't that odd that a Jew would be asking me for a drink? Um, it's, it's an odd situation for her. Yeah. Now you're in a position where you need something from me. And, I, you know, I'm just going to have to think about that maybe a little bit. Well, there's a lot of what's going on here. Yeah. The, yeah. Jesus is going to say, actually, it's not about what I need. It's really about what you need. You just don't know it. And it's not about this drink of water either. I mean, I always think here also, I think Jesus wanted water too, by the way. I think that, you know, he, he did this, thing. I don't know if at some point he said, can I get an actual drink of water for us to continue the conversation? But he was willing, this was his priority here. But in, at some point, coming here in just a moment, he says something to her that changes her, you know, because it seems like right now she's saying, well, who are you? And what is it you're saying? And are you greater than, you're not greater than Jacob, are you? And then you'll see in a moment here, as you know, he says something to her that has her say, okay, now I, now I see you're a prophet. And so there is this, maybe a, you, know, you call it a power struggle. There is this um, kind of a dance going on that says, wait a second, you're saying weird things to me. Who are you? Are, are you special? And so at, you know, this, this idea where she questions that seems like a normal response to me. If some, you know, I would say any of us here, a religion we've known our entire lives, and I'm not, I'm not calling, I'm, maybe I'm misusing the word religion, but a, a, a church experience that we all are familiar with, when that's called into question, of course we respond to it with questions and confusion and, and follow-up. That's natural. But it says Jesus answered and said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give them shall never be thirsty but the water that I will give him will be come and in him a fountain of water springing up to eternal life. Well, now he is describing something to her extremely desirable. Now he's now, he's now described to her, he's back in this, using this water analogy and says, she's talked about this well and how great this well is. And this is Jacob's well. And you're not better than Jacob, are you? And he said, this water here and this well, um, you're going to drink it, and then later today you'll be thirsty again. This water um, does not eternally quench your thirst. But I have water that I give, and a person is never thirsty again. And it will become in them a fountain springing up to eternal life. What, I mean, what a powerful description of the teachings of Jesus Christ, that what he delivers is the quenching of a, a life thirst forever. Um, and I think we all see that that is how human beings are. We have a need and an emptiness. Um, we seek e eternity and Jesus here is saying, the physical water you're going to drink, it's really just going to have to always be replenished. But I am going to offer you something that you'll never be thirsty again. And I just I love this analogy where he doesn't just say, you're going to drink this once, and then that will make you never thirsty again. He, does, I mean, he says that, but he says how it is that it goes about keeping you from being thirsty ever again. How is that? It is... It is now a fountain inside you that is constantly refreshing. 
what, a, what an amazing picture of the Word of God and of God's plan, that it's not just quenching a thirst temporarily. It is creating in us a, a, a source from God of, of eternal water, that this water is constantly... And th- what is it that is the outcome of this water, that we quench thirst with physical water? What does this water accomplish? Yeah, eternal salvation. And so it says that this fountain, the, you know, this isn't a well. By the way, you know, there's a difference between a fountain and a well. Uh, a well is, is, you know, you go down to an aquifer, and I'm about to show you, I know how, I don't know how science works. But I think there's an aquifer down there, and you go down and you dip water out of where the water is. Uh, but the idea of a constant source of water, this, this uh, production of water is very different. And the fact that that is springing up in us and the outcome is eternity, is eternal life. What, you know, the, just, this story is so, it, it's so enticing. Go ahead. Yeah, it's, it's, it, it's, it, it, it does that to us and then it, it, it becomes obvious yeah, that, that we have this. It is a source. So he is providing not just a place to get it, he is providing a source of water that leads to eternal life. What is the woman's response when she hears him describe this water that will is, you'll never thirst again and it will be a fountain in you springing up to eternal life? What is her response? Yes, how do I get the water? This is the water that I want. He, she said, okay, <clears throat> give me this water and I will not be thirsty, nor come all the way here to draw water. There seems to be here, you know, she has focused on what part of this? Yeah, she says, <clears throat> I mean, clearly getting water, I mean, I think that's one of the things we, it's extremely hard for us to ever understand, that going and getting water, you know, might have been a daily activity multiple days a week, or it is excruciating, it is extremely difficult. And so she said, I want eternal water. I want eternal refreshment. I want this. I want this relief. And so she says, I don't want to be thirsty anymore, and I certainly don't want to have to come and get this water. And so we're going to have to end here now, but I mean, I will tell you, the, the, the back and forth here, it's real hard to follow because his next statement is, go get your husband. And so that's where we're going to end this time, that in this conversation that is clearly leading toward this, um, just this pivotal teaching from Jesus, she's, he tells her about the water and she wants it. And the next thing he says is, bring your husband here. And this is where he starts to once again try to use this one-on-one opportunity to not just teach this person, but for eternity record, forever record uh, the truth of his teaching. And so that's where we're going to, we'll start next Sunday, is look at what Jesus now leads to in this conversation when he tells her about this spiritual eternal water. She wants it, and perhaps the counterintuitive to us way that he leads to teaching her about what that water is and, and how to use it. Okay, I appreciate your input tonight. We'll look forward to seeing you again.